It's a big city, and it's a big city with a big name that goes with it. Like Jonah was very aware of what he was going into Nineveh. He knew the environment. He heard the horror stories. He knew what it was going to be like, and he had determined it was going to be bad. It was not going to be good because of all the stories that came out of it. This is a place of violence. This is a place that if they don't like you, they'll just do away with you and then put you on display for everybody to see. I mean, there's a lot of fear that Jonah had, rightfully so. I, I get the fear side of it, where I get a little confused, is the clarity that God gave Jonah. Like, he just gave him such clarity. Go! Yet he held on to that fear. Which shows you kind of the humanity that Jonah had as well. So he's not just some old-time Bible character. We're, we can connect with that too. We can connect with that we know in our heart that we need to do something, but we'll still be kind of ruled by fear. That the fear of the, of the situation outweighs the clarity of what God just said. Yeah. So beginning to navigate those waters, we, we watch John on a learning curve doing that. And a lot of us are on that same journey as well. So he goes to the city. It took him about three days to get across. And Jonah began the journey by proclaiming, he, he, as he was going, he was proclaiming 40 days and Nineveh will, will be overthrown. 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Verse 5 says, The Ninevites believed God and a fast was proclaimed for all from the greatest to the least to put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning had reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne. He took all in his royals, covered himself in sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Let's see if we can re-look re re at that a little bit. The Ninevites believed God, and a, and a fast was proclaimed from the greatest to the least. And then the second verse says, when the word got to the king, so who got the word first? As you guys read that, how, how, did this, how, did this, how did this message, what's the word, like, disseminate? How did it move up? It went from where? It went from the people, that's how I read it. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong on this, but it's how I read it. And it says that the people turned immediately. The people turned and they proclaimed a fast, and they put on sackcloth, and they began to move. And then the word of the God, and the end of the word got to the king. So you're saying that the people can change the culture hmm. in this? Or do we have to sit around and wait on the leadership to get it together before we begin to move in the direction that God has for us? Do we have to sit around and wait on our politicians to get it together before we can begin to move with the conviction in our heart? Do we have to sit around and wait on all of these things to happen so that we can look and go, well, I thought I heard him, but when the, when the leaders told me I heard him, I guess I really heard him. I don't think it works that way. Jonah went through the town, and he's saying, hey, destruction is coming, and people's hearts are turning away from this. And then it moves up. So people can change the climate around us. We can change this area. We don't need to wait on things to happen in Washington, D.C. Right. We can change this area. We don't need for the school systems to get it together. We can change this area. We don't need for the hospital systems to get themselves together. We can begin to do things to make drastic changes to the way we know things currently. As we step into obedience to what the Lord is saying to us. And we're saying, go here, not here, turn from here, don't do that. And we're saying yes to those things. What begins to happen to the leaders around us? Mm -hmm. What begins to happen to our governments around us? What begins to happen to our families around us? Or our parents around us? Or our grandparents around us? Or all of these things that have held us like this order. Before I do anything, I've got to check all of these things out to make sure it's completely correct. But the word of the Lord was sent and you heard it. What kind of response is made? We'll keep going. It says in verse 6, it says, When Jonah... When Jonah's uh, warning had reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne. He took off his royal robes and covered himself with sackcloth and sat down in the dust. 
But I'm adding things here. And I don't want to add things to Scripture. But I would like to think not only did the warning reach him, but word that people have been changing had reached as well. Like it moved in a wave that it just wasn't this outlier thing. But it's saying, whoa, whoa, something is drastically different here in Nineveh. And I've got two options here. I can pull away from it, or I can cooperate with what God is doing. And he cooperates. Many of us don't know this. Some of us do sackcloth. Do you see this in Scripture? Sackcloth is a, um, with the term, if it is, is, it's a way of humbling ourselves. And it was actually usually male goats that they would skin and then turn them inside out. So the coarse hair would be what rubbed against our bodies. Mm. So we would take off all of our clothes and we would put this, this outfit on that would irritate us. And we would sit in the dust, irritated, as a sign to go, I lost. I absolutely lost. And you have won. It's a humbling sin. And it's known across the whole land. You see it as the Israelites are doing it. And the Ninevites called for it too. It wasn't a new practice to them. Like, they knew about it as well. The king went so far as to say, Hey, not only do I want the whole nation to do this, I want you to do this for all the animals. I want you to do this for every living thing. That it will not eat or drink. It will wear sackcloth. It will acknowledge. It will acknowledge the fact that we are turning from it. This is the proclamation that he issued to Nineveh. By this decree of the king's nobles, this is what he said. Do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let the animals so that let the animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let everybody call urgently on God. And let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent. See, there's a little bit of a fear there. He may change his mind. And right now he's saying that we can have a future of peace. But he could change his mind. That's what's happening here. God may relent with his compassion and turn with fierce anger. So we may not perish. When God saw this, that they did this, how they turned from their evil ways. He relented and did not bring them in the destruction that he had thrown. Mm. God came in and said, listen folks, there's going to be change. The stern hand of the Father came in and said, we cannot continue to move like this anymore. And sent John into this nation, into this spot, that if you, if you really study Nineveh, this was a very prominent nation, very prominent nation, high influence of a nation. Some people, some historians believe it's currently Kabul, Iraq, is if you, if you look at the, kind of the archaeological side of where it is. Like, it has been an influential spot for thousands of years. And God's giving them a shot. He's saying, turn, turn, turn to me, and I will let you live. Yes. We always want to talk about all this redemption stuff and the sweet stuff, but sometimes God just looks at us and says, you need to make a change. Yes. Yes. You need to change and turn to me, because the path to which you're traveling down, if you do not, will lead to destruction. Yeah. It's that hard love side of the Father. This is not a, a message where grace isn't here. Grace is all through this. Grace is just intertwined through the entire thing because the Ninevites should not have made it. Yeah. God saw that they turned to Him and His grace stepped in and said, yes, I extend my grace where I'm not expected to. There's a better word. It's not should. It's God can do whatever He wants. We often carry what the what we think God's what, what what we expect God to do. We see Jonah doing that the entire book. And you haven't sat and read this in over this series. I encourage you just to read it through in one sitting. It's, it's four chapters. It takes you about eight minutes. Read it through and see what's happening. 
that Jonah is, Jonah had his own expectation of God, of himself, and certainly of the Ninevites. And he had determined that they were not worthy of this grace. Even though God told him they were, he was so held fast by his own agendas and his own opinions and his own problems, really, call it what it is, his own fear issues that he dealt with, that he began to reject what God was saying so clearly to do. See, God, God stands outside of time. God knew that grace was going to be extended. He knew. So, why the journey for Jonah? What's happened in his heart? Or what didn't happen in his heart that God's wanting us to see now? Because the book kind of ends a little weird. So Jonah finally agreed to go. Which is so hard for me that he agreed to go. It's like God just told you to go. Get up and move. And we say that as we read it because it's really clear. But do we act like that? Do we actually believe that? Can we point to positions and times in our life where we can say, Yep, I heard absolutely no question about it. God said move. And we move. Do we have those? I think we'd have a whole lot more of them if we started listening to God. Because many of us have, and I, I struggle with this, we hear these, these twinges, these little ideas. Like, oh, I should go there. I should say something to that person. I should ask them do they know Jesus. I should buy that person a coffee. I should do something. And we all think like, oh, no, that's just me trying to be nice. Or that's just me doing this. Maybe it's God telling you to do something so that person's heart is turned to God. Are these things off the table? I'd like to think they're not off the table. Because if they are off the table, then things begin to water down very, very quickly. As in the of how we interact with the redemptive side of God. And how we interact with introducing people to Jesus. Like there's a task for us to do. I'm thankful that God uses bullheaded people like Jonah. <laughs> Call it what it is. I'm thankful that some of us who are stubborn and bullheaded. And have it all figured out. Or highly religious. Which is another way of it's being bullheaded. So we know everything. But God still uses him. Yeah. Like he still has like, there's, there's actual things for him to be doing. Yeah. Like some of us have just accepted that our, our time of doing things is over. No, it's not. Amen. It's not over. It's not over at all. Right. There's tons for us to be doing. Tons. Yes. And if you have accepted the fact that your season here is over... And now you're just going to coast through until you reach eternity. I hope that you come to the altar and we break that. Yeah, amen. amen. We break that. Because that's not, that's not of God. Amen. I just say it very bluntly, it's not. No. We all have a task to do because Jesus lives in our hearts. And because he is in our hearts, he's changing us. Yes. And he's moving us. And he's giving us new projects. And he's giving us new people. And it's like nowhere does it say, get your heart right with Jesus and hide in the corner. <laughs> It just, it doesn't work that way. So God uses bullheaded people and it's so exciting because it makes us fit into the category. Because we're messed up. At least me. James looks, great. James looks at me sometimes like, alright. I'm not going to say anything. You're not going to change, but alright. We spent the first week of this message looking at chapter 4. Mm -hmm. Talked about it two weeks ago. Talked about it last week. Just the very end. So after Jonah finally cooperates with the Spirit of God and goes, he comes out. He sits down. He begins to get angry. He begins to get angry that God did exactly what God said he would do. That God turned people to him. Yet he's still angry. 
What is he angry about? So he's sitting there. And God knows he's angry, so I kind of think God's supposed to mess with him at this point. So, because uh, God does that, I think it's funny. And uh, he tells he a big tree to grow up. So Jonah's like, ha, oh, thank goodness the tree came. And then he calls the worm to come, uh, a wind to come. It gets all hot or whatever. There's a couple of things happen. And then God, the same person who made the tree grow up overnight, sends a worm to kill the tree overnight. So here Jonah is sitting there in the dirt, mad. Just angry. Like, I want to. Words for Jonah. Call him a monk and stab me. I repent of that. In the name of Jesus. I just get so frustrated with him. It's like, did you not see what you just did? In the last however many weeks of your life, you've been on a boat that almost sunk. You were thrown over to die. You went in a fish. You lived through that experience. You talked to God. He talked to you again. You went on to the beach. You went to Nineveh. You did what they said. And they all turned to him. And now you're sitting on the side of a mountain. Mad. Yeah. It's like, fix your life. <laughs> fix your life. It's broken. Pick it up, verse 9. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said. I'm so angry, I wish I would just die. Like I said, fix your life. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend to it. You didn't make it grow. Come on now. It sprang up overnight, and it died overnight. In other words, how much could you have got attached to that? <laughs> it just got here, and it just left that fast. And should I not have concern? So you're concerned about the plant. Should I not be concerned about the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right from their left? And so many others. Jonah was looking at the situation of things God was looking at. Oh, that, that's my note. Right that part. That's my part of my notes. Jonah was looking at what he knew. And he saw it very differently. He saw that he had a task to do. He went to do that task. Came back. Sat down. And just kind of checked off the list. But he didn't actually see into what he was doing. Because he held a perspective that was not the same perspective God had. See, Jonah's perspective that he held was, one, I don't think that they needed God. I don't certainly think they deserve it. I'll drag my stubborn tail over here and be obedient. And I'll do it. But I don't really think they need it. And I certainly don't know if I think they're worth it. This is the perspective he's had. I think that's his perspective that fits really well with our culture now. What's going on? That we all determine very easily of what people groups are important, what are not. What issues need our attention, what doesn't. And usually many of them are what we're close to or have some background in. So that means our own culture is more important than anything. Then God just levels them. Here he is, he did all these things, he's sitting there talking about a plant. And God says, whoa, 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 whoa. These are people. In fact, there's 120,000 people that we see the redemptive side of God that says, I love my creation. And my greatest creation is people. Yes. My greatest priority is people. Amen. Your situation, your background, your culture, your religion, all that falls by the wayside. Because the, the concern that God had here was that His created people turn to Him. Yes. So the book really ends with two perspectives. Jonas, of stubborn obedience. He's not all that. He 
didn't do what he said. And then God just said, hey, hey. But there's people there. See, we look at all these environments around us. Pictures of Haiti. Look at all these things seen right now. And do we see that trees are falling? We see that houses are messed up? Or do we see the people in those pictures? There's people in those pictures. I saw a picture earlier today when I was looking back there with Paris was stuff. Was it today or yesterday? I don't know. It was, a, it was a man with a woman on his back wading through the water with two children on her back. And it's like, and the caption said something about high water. <laughs> that the flooding had died. Didn't say a word about the woman and the man and the children who were just trying to get to a place where they weren't going to drown. Yeah. We're talking about life and death. People matter. Yes. Amen. Situations around people matter. It matters. The city of Nineveh and all of its violence and all of its pulling away matter to God. Yes. And Jonah didn't quite get that. Jonah didn't quite understand the matter portion of it. He knew the law portion of it. He knew the right portion of it. He knew all of those things. So the same God who has the authority to say, I can destroy you. He said, no, 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 I want to save them. Yeah. Yes. I want to know them. And let me tell you, that same God's on the throne, guys. Yes. Hallelujah. We walk in grace. Amen. But it doesn't make him not powerful. Yes. It doesn't make him not just. It doesn't make him not all of those things. But we have an access point Extended to us on the cross through Jesus. Amen. Jonah was going in to Nineveh to extend the grace of God if he understood it or not. And God began to do things in the hearts of those living in that town and living in that city. I believe ahead of time. So as Jonah walked in and started proclaiming 40 days, they said, I'm here. I'm ready. Because it does matter what we do. But it also matters that God is preparing the way for us to do things. That He is softening soil. That He is turning things over. That He is making environments ready to receive the grace that's getting extended. Amen. But here's the thing. We don't get to pick whose environments are ready. At least I don't think so. I believe that we are charged to say, you have breath in your lungs, and Jesus loves you. Yes. You have breath in your lungs, and he has a bright future for you. Amen. And because of that love, and because of that future, you can change your life, the life of your family, everyone around you. You guys, as I read Jonah, as I read through this, I'm personally convicted, that's what I think of going Lord, who have we forgotten about? Mm -hmm. And who, bigger than forgotten, who have we determined is not worth it? Mm -hmm. That's the one that hurts my heart the most. Is what people group, what person, what family member, what job, what boss have we just decided you're not worth it? And say, God, correct us. Because we want to be people who say you are worth it. Yeah. Jesus came for you yeah. the same way he came for me. Put us on the same playing field. Amen. We're all this together. So as the band joins us, we're going to go back into worship for a little while. And we're going to have time here at the altars. And you can come pray by yourself. Or I'll pray with you. Other people can pray as well. And as, as we end this series. I want to end it with a spot that's saying, Lord, give us your perspective. 
Give us your eyes. Give us the things that you see. And Lord, help our ears and our feet to catch up. Help us move quickly to do the things that you have to do. So as he offers the if you just want to pray privately, confess, do whatever you need to do. Okay? If you need someone to pray with you, I'd love to pray with you. And just pray a, a, a prayer of freedom to be going where fear maybe has sat there. A prayer of freedom where um, you know that you hold a, a bias towards certain people, that you're asking that just to be removed in the name of Jesus. Because it's, it's not of him. Everyone's worth it. If you're asking for, you really have a, you have a word in your heart, the Lord has spoken to you, and you need other people to stand with you. Not a word for the body, but I'm saying a word to you. The Lord has given you instruction, and you've been on the fence going, I, I heard it, but I'm not going. I heard it, but I'm not going. And if you need some people to stand with you to help you get over that hurdle, to go, I'm moving on this because this is what the Lord has told me to do. We want to pray with you about that. This next song we're going to sing is called Alpha. You guys, this is a song that gets really intimate. So we'll stand, kneel, you know, whatever you need to do. Okay? But the term Abba is the word for dad. So it goes a bit further in the permissions than just father. Because father is, is the term, you know, like, hello, father, how are you, dad? But when, when your son comes into your office or comes into your bedroom and says, dad, there's, there's a level of permission granted in the dad. He's saying, I want to relate that way with you. I want to go into those vulnerable spots with you and walk hand in hand with you. Because you belong to me. You are mine. Friends, if you don't know who this Jesus we talk about, I really want to introduce you. We'd love to. But let's just worship, okay? Let's just press into what he's doing over the next while.